Good evening, everyone. My name is Beth Dunphy, a Deputy Executive Director here at Goddard Riverside. I'm delighted to welcome you to this conversation between Rod Jones, Goddard's Executive Director, and Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President. Our apologies for being a couple minutes late. We had a few technical difficulties, but we're on track now. This is the third in a great series of conversations for our Social Justice Never Sleeps Gala. Last week, we had an incredible discussion between Darlene Surreal from our Options Program and Arva Rice, the President and CEO of the New York Urban League. If you missed it, I highly recommend watching the video. Next week, October 22nd, is our last in the series with Dr. Erwin Redliner, Director of the Pandemic Resource and Response Initiative at Columbia. This will all culminate with our virtual gala on October 29th. I hope you can join us. At the gala, we'll be announcing the winners of our Social Justice Book Prizes for youth and adults. We announced our shortlist earlier this month, 10 great reads covering a wide range of issues that are worth exploring. Details for all the conversations, our gala, and the book prizes are available on our website or by clicking the banner above our heads. I'd also like to shout out some of our sponsors for the gala and this speaker series. Two of our biggest are Penguin Random House and Workman Publishing. These two houses also support our community in a variety of ways throughout the year, from volunteering to toy drives. We're so grateful for their ongoing partnership with Goddard Riverside. I've got a few quick housekeeping announcements to share. We can't see or hear the audience tonight, so you don't have to worry about accidentally turning on your micro camera, but we hope you'll engage in the conversation in the chat. Please type any questions or comments in the chat section. We'll take the audience questions at the end, but you can enter them throughout the presentation. Keep in mind, there's a slight delay, about 30 seconds in the video. And if you're joining us a few minutes late, the event will start from the beginning so you won't miss a thing. If you have any technical difficulties, there's also a support tab where we can help you troubleshoot. You can also adjust the sizing of your chat section or the video by dragging the gray edges of each section. And if you hover your mouse, the controls will pop up, allowing you to make the video full screen, pause the action, adjust the volume, or pin a video in the corner of your screen. Now, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Rod and Gail. Rod's been Goddard Riverside's executive director since 2017. He previously served as the president and CEO of Grace Hill Settlement House in St. Louis and the community place of Greater Rochester. He holds a doctorate in education from St. John Fisher College. And as a, as a native New Yorker, he grew up in Cypress Hills houses in Brooklyn. Gail Brewer is our 27th borough president of Manhattan. She took office in 2014 recently serving as the chair of the Large Cities Council of the National League of Cities. She's a member of their Human Development Federal Advocacy Committee. Gail previously served on the city council for 12 years, representing our own sixth council district. She serves city government in various roles and also has nonprofit and private sector experience. An Upper West Sider, Gail has an MPA from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Please join me in welcoming Rod Jones and Gail Brewer. Thank you, Beth, and good evening. Thank you um, so much, Gail, for joining us tonight. It's good to see you. Um, so, Gail, just, just to start, can you give us a sense of kind of your background and what, what made you get into public service? Okay, so my background. Um, I, I actually learned what I learned from Ruth Messiger uh, in the 1980s on the West Side, a lot from Goddard and Bernie Wall. And that's really where I got started in public service. I actually go back to working for the Parks Department in the Lindsay administration and uh, worked for the state uh, woman named Marianne Krupsek, who was the first woman to run and win statewide. Uh, she was lieutenant governor under Hugh Carey. But it's really working for Ruth Messiger in the 1980s, where I learned about uh, how to organize affordable housing, single room occupancy, um, all the things that I think Goddard cares about. So I would say that's really where I got my training. I do come out of the women's movement. I was head of the National Women's Political Caucus, which was an organization uh, that helped women get elected. I was head of it in the state of New York, winning around the whole state, helping women get elected. Sometimes it was just one woman in the entire county. So that's how I got started, was the women's movement and Ruth Messinger. Nice. So, so Gail, help help us understand the the role of the borough president. You know, we, we there's city council, and then there's the mayor. And so, what 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 help us to understand the the borough president's function? 
Well, it is complicated because it's not defined. You know, we know what the mayor does. He is the one who sets the agenda, passes the budget with the city council, and obviously runs the city. The borough presidents, there are five of us. We get along very well. Before the pandemic, we used to have lunch uh, every couple of months. We had a lot of fun, a lot of gossip. Um, the borough president has four charter mandated. Number one is the role of the land use and zoning. And we play a role in everything from, you know, how to rezone East Harlem, East Midtown, Inwood, Soho, NoHo, uh, Garment Center, uh, South Street Seaport. Um, there are many, many places where we've had a role in terms of that effort, not to mention all the individual uh, requests. And so it's about 100 and almost 200 times that in the last seven years we have intervened in terms of land use. And then, of course, the final decision is made by the uh, city council with input from the community board uh, and obviously the, um, the mayor in terms of the city planning commission. So that's number one. And there's a lot of effort in each and every decision. The second is appointments. So obviously you hear about the community boards and there are uh, 12 of them in Manhattan, 59 citywide. The community boards in Manhattan have 600 members and we appoint all of them. Every other year there is a uh, 300 people appointed. We do it in consultation with the city council and we try to do it representative of the demographics of the area. Um, we have really improved I think the quality, we have trained, uh, we have really phenomenal training, obviously Robert's Rules of Order, technology, which is my background, uh, how to use data, um, obviously land use, budgeting, uh, how to uh, write a resolution, all of that goes into the training. But it's also uh, boards, cultural boards, health boards, school boards, Solid Waste Advisory Boards, 1,000 people um, that we train. So that's number two. Number three is allocating of funding, not dissimilar from the city council and the mayor. And then the fourth is we can introduce uh, legislation. We have to do it with a council member. We've introduced in about 40 some bills and passed about 20. And the one I'm most proud of is the one I did with Jamani Williams, which basically is a fair chance bill that says if you have um, applied for a job and if you are asked about your criminal justice history, any kind of crime that you committed and you finished it, you're not allowed to do that. The owner of the business, the employer cannot ask that question. They can ask it if you get the job. So for instance, if you apply for a job in a, a restaurant and you get the job in terms of your offered, then you can be asked. But up to then, you cannot be asked, either online or on paper. And then finally, it's what you make of it. Uh, in our office, I think I'm very proud of the fact that we opened a, a constituent storefront office in Harlem between Morningside and uh, Amsterdam Avenue. First time a borough president has ever been in a storefront. They're usually in a tall building or in a as in Staten Island in a very fancy, lovely, old, but very hard to get into building. And then finally, you make it what, you, what you're what you interested in. We are very interested in data. So we actually have embedded into our office uh, an organization, nonprofit called Beta NYC. And that staff does nothing but work with students from CUNY, learn how to organize and unpeel, so to speak, the uh, open data platform, which I passed as a council member. Every city agency has to contribute all of their data to this platform. And then how does it help the neighborhoods? So it's, you know, we, we, we do things that are, I think, somewhat unusual in our office, but it's trying to think how can we best help the community? Good. So, so Gail, just to, to kind of follow up on your, your earlier opening about about your history, um, you know, I think about New York in the '70s when I grew up, and you know, it 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 was a it was a bit of a different New York. You know, recognizing that there were some things great, some things needed work. You know, the economic condition was a bit different. 
we had high rates of people in public assistance, and so there's sort of economic change. And so there's both good and bad. And so as we think about New York now, where neighborhoods have changed a lot in terms of gentrification, and uh, we have some pockets of deep poverty and some some sur in surrounding areas where affluence is very high, what kinds of things do you think we need to do as a city um, in order to make sure that New York stays strong? Well, then everybody says, you know, it was hard in the 1970s. I was here also uh, because, you know, there was graffiti on the subways. And, you know, I think crack came in actually January 1982. I can remember the date that a young woman, my friend Leslie, came to me and said, oh, Gil, there's something really fabulous happening on the street. But it had started even before January 82. Um, but I don't think it was as terrible as everybody else said, because for a couple of reasons, you could get a job and you could find an apartment. So you didn't have this, you know, you always have some homeless, but you didn't have this economic challenge for each and every person. Obviously, uh, drugs were an issue, graffiti, um, nothing worked the way some white folks wanted, to be honest with you. But I was here the whole time um, working and able to get an apartment that we could afford. So that's a, that's a big deal to be able to do that. Now, here we are in 2020, um, even pre-pandemic. The question is, you know, how do you make sure that some of the aspects of the 1970s don't exist, but also some of the good parts of it do exist. And this city has become unaffordable. Right? That's really a challenge. That's probably number one. Um, even if you're living in an apartment that you can afford, if you're a senior on a social security, maybe a pension, just buying food is hard, particularly in neighborhoods like uh, on the west side where you may be affordable because you've been there for a time, but just buying food, sometimes you have to leave the neighborhood to be able to afford it. Um, and also sometimes you have to leave the neighborhood because there's no food that really is of interest to you. Um, so the question is, you know, how do we, uh, obviously we've got lots of issues now that are clear in terms of transportation, affordability, it's almost like too much healthcare and so on. So the question is, you know, how do you have some kind of leadership that that, that says we're going to do things really differently. You have to have a whole different mindset in order to, I think, look at the good and still keep, um, you know, the, the trains running, so to speak. It, it's, it's very hard. I think without the pandemic and a new leadership, we might have been able to do some of these things. Now it's just layered with other challenges. But maybe, maybe it's an opportunity. Right. And that's the question because... Landlords are now calling me. You know anybody to fill my apartments? I never got that call before. <laughs> so, you know, and there are buildings for sale that, you know, groups like uh, nonprofits like Goddard could perhaps buy for affordable housing that in the past, not possible. So, and also we have people working together. There's obviously lots of divisions, but there's also a lot of good going on in terms of helping others, whether it's food, PPE, um, cleanups, um, you know, all these different things that Goddard knows so well. So there's lots of possible, uh, but the unaffordability kind of is at the top, whether it's food, housing, clothing, transportation, schooling. Until we get some federal funding, it's going to be really hard to deal with this unaffordability issue. That's at the top of the pile, I think. Yeah, and Gail, so Gail, um, you know, you, 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 uh, you, you were in the heart of it with us when we were trying to work through the movement of homeless people from from shelters to hotels, and there was a lot of discourse around that. I think one of the things I discovered is that people didn't quite understand how people could be homeless, and they, it almost appeared that people didn't have a sense of the volume of people who are homeless. And some people get it in their mind that people are homeless because of their own doing. Um, when you talk about affordability, um, can you kind of talk about what has happened from the days of the SROs where those they were set up, where where a single person can rent a room and on minimum wage live to now? 
Yeah, because I've been in the Pennington since 1969. That's when I first went into the Pennington at 330 West 95th Street. And I was just there the other day. So, um, yes, the, the single room occupancy and the West Side, thank goodness, had lots of them. And it was, you know, 250 at that point, it was $250 a month. Sometimes now, maybe I know people who are still living in the SROs and they, they're paying four or $500 a month, um, maybe $800 a month at the most. So the answer to your question is, we're not thinking big enough to know that that's the kind of housing we need. Everybody's like afraid of SROs. But I know people who grew up in them as children and families and individuals. They weren't supposed to be families there, but they were there. And they have done extremely well, partly because we have excellent schools, partly because the rent was affordable so they could uh, take care of other needs that the family and individuals have. What I think a big picture is um, we need Mitchellama housing for middle class because that was the best housing that ever existed. And we made some terrible decisions long ago that said the owner could buy out when his mortgage would able to be paid. And when he paid his mortgage, then he could buy it out. It's a terrible situation. And the same thing for single room occupancy housing, where it was you could share a room, I mean, share a bathroom, share a kitchen. And sometimes, in some cases, you had the kitchenette inside, depending on the building. But what you also had was people were working. They may not have been working at a job that was paying them a lot of money. So in this building, and, and Felice Machete has always told me, when you build housing, don't have 100% homeless. Don't have 100% people who aren't working. Have some people who are working and some people who are on public assistance or social security or whatever kind of uh, benefits they're getting. Then everybody learns from everybody else and often ends up sharing possibilities for working if you're able to work. That doesn't exist now. The way the funding works, and you know about it better than I do, the way the funding works is, you know, supportive housing here. We don't even have new SROs over here. So we don't have any place for somebody who's on social security, doesn't get a pension, or who's on public assistance and doesn't have anything else can live. And, and many of these people are not only good neighbors, many of them are picking up jobs here and there. You hear that all the time when you're in a group like with the men at the Lucerne. Many of them are working, you know, we're down right now, it's nightlife. Yeah. Nightlife is a 14 or 15 or $20 billion industry and it's zero right now. And many of jobs you can pick up a little bit here and a little bit there. Same thing with the movie industry. That's very limited right now. All of these things are the type of things that you don't necessarily get a big salary, but it keeps you going with word of mouth in a building where there's opportunity. So we need SRO, <coughs> sorry, we need SRO housing, which apparently is not able, allowed to be built now. And of course, we need Mitchellamas. Those two would be a big answer to our housing crisis. So, so Gail, you talked a little bit about the pandemic. Um, I, I think most people haven't yet seen the worst of it. So, what do you, what do you think? What do you think is going to happen in the next couple months, and what needs to happen for New York to be whole? <clears throat> Well, I hope you're wrong about not having seen the worst of it because you and I and others who've been here, it's been very, very rough. Um, Midtown is not back. You, you know, you're, the, the offices aren't back. We in the neighborhood, were more active than when you go Midtown. And of course, I go up and down the borough all day long. There's, it's very deserted in the Midtown and downtown where the business community is. I'm hoping, it is true that the spread is slowly creeping up even in Manhattan. Not a lot, but slight. It should be going the other way. I don't know enough. You know, we know about the zones in Queens and Brooklyn and we have some ideas to why that's happening. People are not wearing masks and they're not socially distancing. But where you are socially distancing and where you are using masks and it still seems to be creeping up, I don't think anybody really knows why. Um, I don't think it's necessarily the colleges. I don't think it's necessarily going back to school, but we don't really know. So we have to just keep hoping that um, 
as Dr. Fauci said, by the end of 2021, that's the date he's giving us, there's some relief. I don't have any answers in terms of the health care. We're all just trying to do what has been told to us over and over again that I just described. Um, kids want to go back to school. They don't want to be some. And then in some cases, for good reasons, kids are learning at home. Um, some of the colleges decided, like Columbia undergrad, to do virtual. We have, you know, quite a few colleges. CUNY's going virtual. That's a big presence in Manhattan. Um, NYU decided to go in class. And they do have 21,000 undergrads. Two weeks ago, there had been five cases, but this week they have five cases. So they are testing constantly. If you have an excellent, and I think ours is good, uh, test and trace program, as they do in other countries, then you can keep the COVID down. So I guess the answer to your question is, we really need a really good test and trace program. And then people have to agree to abide by it. That's the other problem. Yeah. Um, you have people traveling, not a lot, but you have pressure. I'm on the governor's recovery task force and the uh, business people are beside themselves because you've got this health care on one side and economic development on the other. So the economic development side is, oh, for God's sake, we cannot quarantine because the airlines won't, nobody's going to come to New York from X country or X state if they have to quarantine. And then they have to quarantine when they go back. So in some places in Europe, apparently, there's a rapid test that is uh, considered believable. So you take your rapid test when you leave, you take your rapid test when you arrive, it's considered believable, and then there's no quarantine. And then the restaurant, the hotel, et cetera, the business opportunity can take place. So that's what the business community wants. The governor has not agreed to that. So you get all these tensions. It's like all day long, it's a tension, as you and I know. And oh, that's yeah. just one more. Oh, yeah. So, so Gail, on the economic side of it, um, I, I know that there was a budget that was passed and there this was seemed to be some hope that there would be relief. What do you think what do you think is looking like? So we're very close to the November cut period. Well, there's three budgets. There's the city budget, there's the state budget, and then there's a federal budget that we read about in the papers, but we haven't seen any uh recent money. We saw some earlier. In terms of the, I think you're talking about the city budget. Yes. Um, you know, the issue is in the past, uh, there was always a November nod, uh, mod modification that would deal with some of the most challenging human services, um, other problems that obviously cropped up. But when you have a $9 billion deficit, which is what the city has, and I think the states has doubled that then it's really hard to say we're going to fund child care, which I know there have been cuts in. We're going to fund, you know, all the money that's owed almost for a year and a half, two years now to the nonprofits. And we're not going to fund the garbage, which we cut garbage collection, sanitation, 65% for weekday, etc. So I don't know how much of a budget mod is going to be relief because what everybody's waiting for is the federal. And everybody's waiting for November 3rd to take place and then see where we're at. Now, waiting until January 20th, even that's a long time for people to to wait. So I don't see a lot happening in the November mod, but I know there is usually some uh, changes, but I don't know how much is going to be here. Um, the governor has not agreed to any kind of a borrowing, which was the other suggestion. Um, I haven't seen that there's any movement there at some point. Some people said, well, he wants $5 billion, he may get $1 billion. And then other pundits state, well, if you start allocating money that's borrowed, then it's harder to get the federal money. But, you know, that we're so far in the hole that borrowing a billion isn't going to close anything. Yeah. So it's, it's very, you, you see it, you know, as even more than I do because you have to, make sure that God of Riverside and all your amazing human services programs are 
running and human services always gets the short end of the of the stick this is true gail i know so gail if you if you you talked about you you hinted at changes in leadership prior to the pandemic if you if you had a magic wand what what kind of leader should we be looking for go, on a go forward basis well, you, in my opinion, it has to be somebody who, it's, it's a very complicated city. You have the, I love big ideas. You gotta have some big ideas. You can't just be nitpicking here and there. I mean, I ha, I'm not always the best on big ideas, but I, I like our streets. So one person has suggested, for instance, just to give an example, it's not a human service example, but the example is, somebody who can be in charge of the public spaces because you right now you have human services on the streets in terms of the homeless you have businesses in outdoor you have bicycles pedestrians deliveries um you have the consumer affairs you have the health department you have scaffolding you get the picture yeah and nobody is uh, and the plazas for the parks department so nobody is like in charge of figuring all that out. So if you're opening the business, even though there's a one stop, you still have to deal with so many different aspects of the streetscape. And I think in urban America, we need to change streetscape. So that's, you know, somebody has to do that. Somebody has to figure out this housing situation. It's not just for the homeless. It's how do we keep families here? And then, um, you know, the, the just how we, how we, think of neighborhoods you know it's it's so segregated it's so um you know i get frustrated because every time i want affordable housing in manhattan i'm told i prefer to go to the bronx scale because my the land is cheaper you know but then i think well then what's manhattan going to look like and what's the bronx going to look like so i think when i say leadership somebody has to first understand how government works you have to figure out the police community issues. I know the mayor just appointed three good people to do that, um, but it's gonna take an awful lot. I would love to see Goddard and CUCS and Breaking Ground and everybody else figure out how we're going to work with human services and police and those who are uh, challenged on the streets. You know, that's a, to me, that's more of a human service issue, not a police issue. Yeah. But what exactly does that look like? So you, your wonderful staff can, um, feel that they're making some headway. What do they need? So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is you need some big picture ideas, but you can't lose, uh, you know, I'm a big believer in government. That's why I ran for office. Government is supposed to do their job. And I think right now government's confused. I know the police are confused. I just left some of them. They're very confused. And I think human services, which, and the arts, I mean, that's another example of streetscape. I mean, the art should be public art, free art, music in the streets, theater in the streets, you know, all of that. And and um, somebody has to have those kinds of ideas so that it's exciting for tourists. We need our 65 million tourists back. Um, you know, you need to have something that people want to participate in both as residents and as visitors. You know, there are lots of people with these big ideas. You just have to be bold and, and go with them. And you have to also, people have to love you. You have to be out in the community. People in New York want to see their elected officials. They want them to be fun. They want them to, um, you know, have a leadership, but also kind of a spirit. That's what I think. I don't know. <laughs> so, so Gail, <clears throat> so Gail, I'm gonna just kind of point directly. So you know, I, I you know I have a, a, a admiration for you, and I, I remember you said, "Listen, when I first got back, you said you gotta you gotta just be tough, you know, you gotta be direct with it." And so I, I often wonder whether you would consider ma running for mayor. I do not like those other boroughs. That's what people tell me. I say it up front. I love my Manhattan, so I'm sticking right here. <laughs> but I appreciate everybody asking me all day long. There's lots of people running, and somebody's going to win. That's what I know. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so Gail, what do you, what do you, so when you think about the time you've spent uh, more locally as, as a councilwoman and then over the entire borough, 
what what kinds of things do you think that um, the, are, can be done from the human service delivery system in partnership with the electeds? Well, um, I would say a couple of things. First of all, I think the, the city as a whole has to have, uh, it's so frustrating to me because you really are, whether it's 9-11, Sandy, or the pandemic, and the list goes on day to day, you are the backbone of the city. And, and so you need to get funded. The elected officials need to fund you like, you uh, you need to be funded. So I think the first issue is the, the, the challenges that you go through in terms of human services are mind blowing in my book. So even, even something like I've been talking about for years, if you want young people to be successful, you have to have a social worker or a Goddard in every single school, just to start, that's a beginning. Because then the issues that you experience as a student, as a family, can be dealt with and not festering. So uh, human services has to be everywhere. It's not something that's over to the side. It has to be part of our everyday life. And I think, you know, I think the mayor did a good job. And I know Goddard has participated in the three and four year old in terms of working with a, a nonprofit sector and the Department of Education. It's not easy, I'm aware of that. Yeah. But that is an example of uh, I think when it started, everybody was like, oh, I don't know if that's going to work. Well, it does work. And so you need more of that kind of nonprofit working with the public sector almost seamlessly. Because, you know, basically you're doing the work of the public sector. The public sector, you're doing the work that they're not doing. You're picking up all the slack. So I think the seamlessness is one of those big issues, big thought processes that has to exist. Um, the, you know, the, the seniors are growing in terms of numbers. You know that as well as I do. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to, uh, you know, figure out for their transportation. Uh, there was a time during the pandemic when they got earlier hours to go to the grocery stores. They want those back, by the way. They want them now. <laughs> in some places, they can swim at certain hours. But more importantly, um, you know, they need to be, uh, thought of not as an afterthought. Everybody loves them because they vote, but they don't then have the support that they needed. Then the list for Phelps House must be like years and years, as an example. Ten years, yeah. Oh gosh! And then the senior centers probably need upgrading, to be honest with you, um, because uh, younger seniors want to participate as well as older ones. How do you put all of that together? It's called funding, and of course, I'm a big technology. Uh, aficionado, so I want everybody to be able to partake in a real way. We've seen those challenges during this pandemic like none others, from bandwidth to device. Um, so, and then, you know, it's it's just hard. You got two people working, you're trying to do the kids, do you have enough after school? Um, that's the kind of thing that social service, human services do. And how do you make it so that it is also very, open to all kinds of people. You could be the place where this racial divide uh, gets addressed, you know, and, and but you're not thought of like that. The human services are not thought of like that. So, I, I mean, you're doing, Goddard has been doing, and, and the settlement houses in general have been the model as to how, uh, how human services should operate. Somebody should fund you though. That's a, that's a challenge. So, so speaking of speaking of, I know we talked about government and we talked about human services. What what about the what about the citizen and how, how what what's the role of the citizens? You know, I, I often think about when I grew up in New York. It, it was something about being New York strong that that you know we were a community, and it was you know like if so, if you got on the bus and somebody was short some change we all kind of pitched in and made sure the person got a ride. What, what kind of has to happen f for us to, to revive some of those things that made New York, New York strong? I mean, I think it still goes on. I was, you know, we all know about the discussions on 79th street with the men at the Lucerne and the challenges. Um, but I ran into a couple of older New Yorkers. Um, they collected money on 79th street 
they then gave it to the social worker at the Lucerne. You know, that's sort of what you're talking about. I mean, they yeah. collected quite a bit of money, but they couldn't get some of their neighbors, I hate to say some younger families, to participate. But they just went door to door, up and down that block, and uh, they gave the funding to the social worker so that he or she could purchase whatever was needed by the men. So there's still, you know, that's still out there. I see, I see maybe because I'm, you know, in the midst of so many different events, but I see a lot of goodness. Um, and you describe it, and it is New York strong, because, you know, people always say New York is so, uh, you know, cold and so on. But, you know, I, I find that what you're talking about exists. What is also existing, which wasn't when you and I were growing up, is something called the internet. And within seconds, you know, everything that's going on. Yeah. And when that's true, don't forget, we probably did, I know I did, you know, some things that I wish maybe I hadn't done, but no internet, so nobody knows, right? Yeah. So now all the bad stuff comes out within seconds. Oh, yeah. And, you know, not as much good stuff. This is so true. I, I always think, you know, you tell the newspaper, oh, I did this, and, you know, it's going to help people, and they don't cover it. Yeah. They like, they like when there's dirt on whatever you bring to their attention. That they'll cover. And, and and before it gets to the newspaper, it's already up on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whatever. So I think to answer your question, to be New York strong, we probably also need to think more about how to use media locally, you know, and, and figure out other ways. Because my students at Hunter, I teach at Hunter with Ruth Messinger, they don't they don't open any newspapers, right? And my my younger staff members don't either. So if you're going to be New York strong, you do have to do it in many different mediums. It's not just the uh, the word of mouth or the newspaper. It's got to be on many different mediums for people to know that you're even doing it in terms of being a generous, wonderful, warm. But I see that so often. I mean, you know where it is. It's at NYCHA. When we were beginning the pandemic, we experienced it. Fresh Direct, to their credit, showed up. And for three weeks, for free, top of Manhattan to the bottom of Manhattan, we selected that they drop off every day at NYCHA. And we met them, and we uh, brought our van, and we brought food to the drop-off development and others. Guess who stepped up? These tenant leaders, they don't get paid. These yeah. tenant leaders got their... Uh, younger sometimes and sometimes older residents to help Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Rodriguez, those are seniors who need food. And they climbed those stairs, they made sure they all got food every single Monday or Wednesday for like six months. That's, you know, you know may not see that in the paper, but that's New York Strong. That's New York Strong, that's right, that's right. So, so Gail, over, so if you were if you were encouraging other women to um, to change or to 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 contribute to to the New York Strong, what would you say to them? Well, this pandemic, apparently, according to the papers, has um, not been good to women in terms of the job situation where women were very much um, part of the uh, revitalization of the economy uh, with the possibility that kids have to be home in order to avoid the pandemic and to do online. Um, people have had to give up jobs or not be the, uh, you know, the, the vibrant, uh, very, very active uh, worker that they were before. And that has changed because that we women were really, really um, driving the economy, uh, small businesses, corporate, um, just generally, of course, we don't need to talk about first responder because guess who it was? It was women and women of color. So we have to figure out, and you know better than I, how the childcare works, how the support works. It's really just combobulated now. And uh, as everyone says, if you're going to have a workforce, you have to have quality child care. It has to be quality. It has to be the hours that are appropriate. I know there's one child care center, I think, at the airport that at least used to be 24-7. Um, that's, that's what you need. That's what you need. And 
the other thing that we need, of course, is, you know, you got to have a serious, even though it's the law, you have to make sure that you don't have this pink ghetto and you have uh, the uh, wages that are appropriate. And then I would, you know, I would say, you know, you need to have the kind of like everybody says, you know, look at Scandinavia. Well, Scandinavia is much smaller, but uh, and everybody says, look at France, you know, because people get more time off when they have adopted or childbirth. But then, of course, we always joked and said, well, they want more French. So that's why they're doing it. You know, they want to have more population. Um, we also have so you have to figure the whole family. And the other thing is we're, we're, thank goodness, much more of a diverse economy than when you and I grew up, before, you know, in the past. And so language, language is terrible in this country. We just think English is fine. Well, it's not fine. And um, I can't tell you how many times I have to tell the city agencies, Did you, do you, are you translating that so that somebody can understand for a small business? Many of the small businesses that I've given out PPE from the top of Manhattan to the bottom of Manhattan in terms of PPE, mass, census, hot days of the summer. It is women of color in these beauty shops, in these bodegas, in these uh, clothing stores. And many people don't speak English. They speak some, but if you're going to get people to participate as workers, it has to be in different languages. In a lot of different languages. Obviously, Manhattan is not the borough with the most uh, different languages. Queens is. It's what makes the economy go. So um, I would say language. And I don't want to forget about the seniors, many of whom are women, uh, even though they're not working. They, too, need serious information in different languages. We saw this with the census um, in Chinatown, if we want to get the material filled out you have absolutely got to have somebody who's trustworthy in your language yes so i i would say for for families in general um they have to figure out how the family is secure in terms of the workforce of the future and you have to pay people uh, a wage that is something that they can live with comfortably and then of course you know you got i'm a big supporter of the labor unions um because there's no question. You get information. Your kids can go to college. Um, you, uh, you, you know, if there's a challenge on the job, you have support. Um, you, you end up from support for your middle class existence and the unions help. The, some of these, you know, I don't mean to pick on any one industry, but between construction, real estate, it's rough if you're a worker. And particularly a worker of color may not speak English. It's rough. They just treat you badly. If you have a union, you know, it makes a big difference. So right. the fast food uh, workers hopefully will get some support. It, it's, again, like everything else. It's sort of like how people look at those who are homeless. They have one image. For people who are not in the union, they don't understand all the good that the union does. Yeah. So, Gail, thank you for that. I'm going to I'm going to turn to a couple of questions for the audience. Um, the, one question is about relates to developer abuse. Um, so, so when developers abuse zoning rules, um, rather than giving them fines that that they kind of poo poo, what about thoughts of taking or making them build additional space for affordable housing that helps to kind of mitigate some of the crisis. Right. I'm 100% with you. There is in Chelsea, or in Clinton, actually, it's called the Clinton Special District. And it was put into effect in the 1970s, I believe, or maybe early 80s. And what it says is, if you as a developer um, harass in any way, shape, or form, and this is somewhat similar to the single room occupancy certificate of no harassment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to get that. And if you don't have that, um, I can tell you several buildings where I was responsible for making sure that the uh, after the individuals in the building were harassed, I made sure that the HPD, Housing Preservation and Development, did not give the owner a certificate of no harassment because they had been harassed. It's a, it's, it's a, the trouble with it is there's not a lot of, uh, you know, lasting uh, support. So 
what usually happens is there is affordable housing built for you know the 10 or 15 people who got harassed for their lifetime and maybe for the future but in this very complicated world and these big buildings you know that's all you get to be honest with you and um you know we have some buildings on the west side i can probably guess which building you know the the person is asking about 200 yeah it's never enough that's my answer i mean if i had my way i'd say you have to do a whole new building you know you got 48 units here well you know what you're gonna have to go buy a 48 unit building somewhere and that's what your punishment is but you know you get 10 11 maybe in another location so it's very frustrating um there is one issue in new york it's called real estate real estate real estate and it's the hardest to be honest with you i can handle health i can handle schools i can handle small business but this real estate is hard this it definitely particularly manhattan it's the where the rubber hits the road in terms of challenges yeah. i'm sure it's money and big business so, so Gail, um, talk a little bit about um, what you, what the differences are between kind of being ha having offices down like at one center, and now you're in smack dab in the middle of Harlem, uh, just across from Grant Projects. Well, I love being, um, and obviously when I was in the city council, I was on 87th and Columbus, and kept the door open all weekend and. Loved every minute of it. Um, on 125th Street, you are uh, very much uh, in the community. Uh, folks in Grant and, and uh, Manhattanville, which is right next door, come over constantly. And it, it's unfortunately the same issue. Elevators are broken. I have mold in my apartment. Um, I have a domestic violence issue. I need to get transferred. And it's been two years. Um, you know, uh, repair hasn't been done, it's been promised. It, it's just the same issue. So you write the letters, you call NYCHA. Um, I hope that this um, Gregory Ross, who's the now president chairman, has an idea that works because otherwise we're gonna be writing the same letters, Rod, forever. Yeah. Um, I, I have no other, I mean, I can literally, so that's what comes into the office a lot. The other issue, which is, you know, you just do the best you can and, and you work with this amazing leadership for some of the other, you know, positive aspects. We've done cleanups. We try to get after school programs. We try to get the laundry room fixed, et cetera. At the same time, you have this amazing African community in Harlem. Um, you have the hair braiders, you have the restauranters. Um, you have the French, uh, you know, after school program. So it, it's, a, it's a mixture. And then you have people just the quality of lifers, as I call them. And they're all races, you know, noise, construction, um, you know, the kinds of things. And then you have the people who really want to work on issues like climate. You have all the, the young people who are interested, particularly in the environment, to be honest with you, that's their main issue their planet for the future. So people just walk in and they get information. There is no other place on 125th Street on a storefront where you can find out about the art programs that are coming up for free or uh, you know how to uh, get a business started or those kinds of things. I love it, to be honest with you. So, so Gail, there's another, now, as we talk about um, storefronts being filled in Harlem, um, the question is, before before we even got to the pandemic, there appeared to be a, a growing number of empty storefronts on the Upper West Side. Um, is there a sense of kind of what was driving that and what might be done to bring businesses back? Yeah. So, uh, yes, and uh, there's definitely uh, a challenge. So in 2017, first of all, I've been working on this issue for a very long time. On the Upper West Side, I passed the only law that's ever been passed in terms of storefronts. Very controversial. Oh, my God. So what it says is that a bank, a new bank, between 72nd and, 100, and 110th Street, Broadway, Columbus, and Amsterdam, cannot be more than 25 feet. And a store 
on Amsterdam and Columbus cannot be more than 40 feet. Obviously, if there's one there, it's grandfathered in. Oh, my God, I get so many calls about it. People hate it. The brokers hate it. The owners hate it. Everybody hates it. But that's the law. Then um, the storefront empties. Even in 2017, um, there was something like 188 from the bottom of Broadway to the top of Broadway. And then we just walked the bottom of Broadway to the top of Broadway. So 70, that was in August 2020, 78% increase in empty storefronts. And now here we are in October. I don't think, I don't know if I want to walk um, because it'll be more. We do have one, we need data because you and I can stay forever. We have terrible, we have vacancies. We have vacant, I don't have any data. So the other law that we passed states that by February of 2021, every owner of a storefront in the five boroughs has to tell the Department of Finance and how many feet and how long it's been vacant. So I have to say it was passed some years. Along comes garbage, along comes um, homeless, along comes hard challenges for the store next door. Because when you have empties on both sides, then you have all these other challenges. And when you're just trying to make it, it's a terrible situation. So it's just one more thing on the list right now. Um, I can't say that there's going to be some miraculous. Now, when you talk to brokers, as I have, they say that the square footage is you know a uh, clothing store because we can make clothing we have a good chance of getting a really good price i don't know because of course when the economy picks up and everybody thinks it will in three years then of course the rent's going to go up that whole issue of commercial rent is on everyone's lips because it always seems to go up and there's no way to challenge that so before the pandemic, there was a lot of, oh my goodness, it's been going on since 1978. Same discussion. Ruth Messinger's bill is still hanging around. I don't know the answer to how do you deal with commercial rents when they go up and you have no way of keeping your favorite bookstore, your favorite pharmacy, et cetera. That's part of that big picture issue that I talked about earlier. Somebody has to figure that out. I, I've been trying, and I think uh, we now even have a bigger issue to, to deal with. So, so, so Gail, it, it would appear, you know, I, I know that there are different perspectives around being conservative or more liberal and kind of to what degree we take care of people, to what degree government gets involved. But you've talked a couple of times about um, issues that are economic in nature whether it be about the inability to contain the cost of space for commercial use or the or the challenges with being able to tame development just because of the the the, the amount of money that's made in the process and the uncontrollable cost to just live every day and so it, it takes me back to this question of can we solve homelessness when when in fact um, it would appear that the cost of space is out of control, that the cost of living continues to rise, and that that even with the fifteen dollar minimum wage, you know, if you think about it, a person who makes minimum wage is at thirty thousand dollars a year. If you have a one bedroom apartment that's two thousand dollars a month, you you're already in trouble. You can't you can't quite make the rent. So it makes me wonder, you know, for as much as we outreach to the entire island of Manhattan to get people off the street, we bemoan the fact that um, that at the end of the chain, there's got to be more housing. So, so what do you think? What do you think has to happen in order for us to get to a more equitable space where um, where where people um, where people who work and sometimes a job and a half or two simply can't keep pace with the cost of living. Right. Well, that is the biggest conundrum 
And I don't want to sound like a broken record, but we just can't do it without the federal government. And you know better than I do, like you talked about the 1970s, but we had subsidies. We had Section 8. We had programs that would subsidize the rent. We had them even through the 1980s. They, as far as I can see, they seem to be completely gone unless, you know, somebody seems to have them in their back pocket, some vouchers. Um, I don't know if in this city at this time, if we can get the rents low enough by the quote unquote private sector. I don't think so. And I don't think the private sector has the will to do it, to be honest with you. So that's where government has to step in. You, you know, the mayor has this program, mandatory inclusionary zoning, but even the 25%, the measly 25% that these taller buildings in some cases where their city interest have to provide affordable permanently. It's not that affordable. And so what the persons that you're talking about, um, and I keep saying the person who's in a similar situation, they're on a, um, they have just social security, they maybe have a small pension or they might not, that person cannot get housing. Yeah. So without the federal government uh, stepping in to provide that subsidy, it could be called section eight or something else. I don't know that there is any solution. You have to have some mechanism between some kind of private sector rent and what the person can pay. I don't think we're going to have what we don't want. I know people commute, commuting, I'm sure you, two hours from Pennsylvania to work on a security job, which probably pays maybe $20 an hour. Yeah. That's craziness. That's craziness. And then what happens if the company needs that person in, you know, some kind of a situation? They're not, that person's not going to be able to be there. Uh, so it's not good for the city to have a workforce that lives far away. It's good for the city to have a workforce that lives where they can get to work quickly. And we haven't even talked about the subway, but th that's another pandemic issue, to be honest with you. So yeah. I, I think the answer to your question is, you know, we, we all know this, you know, between Apple, Facebook, Google, and Amazon, all of whom are building in this city right now and expanding. And there are other many Wall Street firms doing well. I don't think it's just tax the rich. That doesn't always solve the problems that you and I care, to, care about. It has to be redirected in the places that actually make a difference. And so you do need to have either, you know, a different kind of leadership that um, can figure out how to, if, if we have a democratic administration, then making sure urban America gets their share. I will tell you, having worked in the Dinkins uh, office administration in Washington, and for a quick second, about a year, it was Democratic. They don't like New York City any more than the Republican. Don't be. Don't think that just because it's Democratic, you know, because you probably you've been in other parts of the country. I've never been anywhere. I had to stay here, but I hear that the Democrats also they, they want to take our Medicaid money, Democrats to Arizona and New Mexico. I was always fighting to try to keep our Medicaid money here to pay for our teaching hospitals. They'll take it in two minutes, yep. and they'll take they'll take our subway money, turn it into highway money faster than you can blink an eye. Yeah. So it's it, it's it's a it's a fight at every level to keep the greatest city in the world, the greatest city in the world as it has been. So I think the answer, I don't have a good answer to your question. Housing, uh, we need money for the arts. We need money for transportation. Those do come, I think from the federal government, at least to get us back on our feet. Yeah. And Gail, what, what is your sense in terms of uh, the volume of mandatory inclusion, inclusionary housing? Is it, is, it, is it here and there? Is it just kind of a compromise? Well, it's definitely here and there. Um, I mean, I have to deal with this. This is what I do all day long, is deal with this real estate issue, deal, deal with these real estate issues. So if you know, in, the, in Manhattan, it's been the least number. I want to say four, I'm guessing 434, something like that, units of mandatory inclusionary zoning in the last seven years. So it's higher in the other boroughs because, as I said, the land is cheaper. And so uh, developers like to go there. Mandatory inclusionary zoning only happens if the owner wants to go a different way than the zoning, higher, obviously. 
<clears throat> and so in that particular case, they have to do mandatory inclusionary zoning. But if they can find a way not to do um, mandatory inclusionary zoning, they will do that in a second because they don't want to go through the EULIP process. I don't think they want affordable housing in their building, to be honest with you. And even when you have it, there is a fight and a half because it has to be rental, obviously, and then the rest of the building is condo. And then you're into another challenge in my book about uh, them and us, and I don't like that. But you know, there's only so much as borough president you can do to fight. Yeah. So if you really want an equal city, I think these developers, they need to make money. The construction needs to be union. The construction workers need to be busy. And um, But you have to figure out something that puts everybody in much more of a level playing field than what we're in now. Um, maybe it's less tax abatements. You know, everybody seems to get 421A or J51. It just needs a whole overhaul. Uh, we are working in our office with a, actually every Friday, a wonderful group of people trying to figure out this affordable housing crisis. And goodness knows Goddard has done it many times over, figured out how to do it. But it's hard. Yeah. And I just wish you could do more of it. And I want to congratulate you from the Capitol Hall to all the other programs that you have housed people in. Yeah, we, you're right, Gail. It costs money to build and to buy. <laughs> Um, so, so Gail, we're we're down to the last um, we're down to the last couple of minutes. So, what 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 do you think we should be doing now, in order to get to a more fair and equitable city on the other side of this pandemic? Yeah, I think you. I think you have to fix your mic. Yeah, well, we're in. We're in the last two minutes, so I'm, I'm gonna. Gail, Gail, no worries. I'm gonna. I'm gonna wrap up from here. So, so Gail, thank you so very much. Um, you know that. You know that God loves you, and we all love you for all that you do for the community. Um, we we thank you for spending your time with us tonight. Um, and so so certainly we're sure that we will see you in the community. And to all the people who joined us tonight, thank you so much for taking time uh, to join us and to, to for a, a, a conversation with Gail Brewer, our borough president. So thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you, Gail. I want to thank both Rod and Gail for this incredible discussion. I'm glad that your mic only cut out at the end, Gail. That was good timing. Thank you. Um, I hope everyone will join us again next Thursday when we have another great conversation with Dr. Erwin Redliner. We'll be talking pandemic. So have a great night and thank you all so much.